So we won't start formally now, but we can always uh, we can always chat. Yes. Yes. Is creative, creative, yes. But it is only created to the extent of the data that is stored to it. So you still need the human mind and, and the computer. I mean, you are the expert, so um, so he's an a AI expert. True, um, but you know, human beings are also creative depending on the data given to us, right? So we make something of it. I recently asked Chat GPT to write me a poem on Swami Vivekananda. And it did a great job. Nice poem. I mean, it's it's not. It's not, you won't get a Nobel Prize in literature, but it was not a bad poem. And uh, I think a, a, a 10th grade student good at English would have written that poem. It's, it was in flawless English. And, and the more, the, the real power of it lies, I guess, where I asked it immediately afterwards to make, give me another poem on Vivekananda. It gave me another poem, quite a different poem, and again, good. And I'm sure... Every time you ask me, every minute it can generate another poem for, for me on Vivekananda. It can. It will change that. It, it, depending on the prompt, it's basically it com depends on the prompt you give it. So that's the power. And again, to me, that just shows the beauty of the Sankhya analysis. That everything in this universe is nature including brain, mind, mind. According to Sankhya and cosmology, even mind is part of nature. So creativity is part of nature. I think the real difference between how AI does it and how we do it is we, are, we do it differently. You guys are approach, you're getting the same results, but doing it in a very different way, using a silicon-based computer and the algorithms. And, and we are using mind, psychology, whatever they are, uh, to produce the same type of results. Yeah. Can AI do a research? I'm sure it can be a powerful, a researcher with AI is a powerful researcher. Right now, they are, what they're saying is, uh, it's not that it will replace human beings, but uh, AI, human beings supported by AI will replace human beings supported without AI support. Yeah, that's right. Still, but you know, it is still in the early days of AI. Yeah. If you talk about the idea of the mind being a big mind all across the universe, as AI starts generating its own content, then it will start poisoning the idea of, of, of human creativity because everything that is created will be, also be generated from AI. So AI is training itself on AI generated content. Right. So at that point, I think human. Inputs into these systems becomes all the more important. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a new world. <laughs> I don't know how far this is true, but somebody told me Sam Altman, the yes. person yes. who designed the chat GPT, somebody asked him somewhere that uh, uh, tell us something that you believe, which yes. is generally not common knowledge. And, <laughs> and he, he, he tweeted that, right? And he said, Atman is Brahman. I believe that. Huh? Somebody was trying to set up a conversation between Sam Altman and me, uh, but it never happened ultimately. He was too busy at that time. Uh, yeah, you had a question. Uh, Swami Vivekananda talked about the role of AI. Yes. Right? So where does the role fit in with the consciousness part of AI? Yes. Um, Swami Vivekananda said free will is a misnomer. There is freedom, which is freedom from nature, from causality. And there is will. But will ultimately is also not free. Um, there is freedom, but it is beyond will. That will, that freedom is not in the realm of willing. The, uh, I think I've, there's a talk on, on free will which I've given. Uh, let me just summarize my, my, what my view is. I mean, uh, my view is a Vedantic view, which has been put very beautifully by Professor Arindam Chakrabarti in, her, in an article which is called, Why Pray to a God Who Can Hear the Anklets on an Ant's Feet. Now, this is a quotation from Sri Ramakrishna. 
Sri Ramakrishna is in Bengali he used to say that is your can khodke that means he he hears everything you can't uh, he doesn't miss a sing, single thing the god hears everything he hears the the sound of anklets on an ant's feet now in little children uh, in india the boys especially girls they wear anklets little anklets now imagine the anklets on an ant's feet how tiny an ant is and if you put an anklets on ant's feet and the sound made by that god hears so that's a very cute way of saying that god <laughs> hears everything now this philosopher arindam chakravarti asks so why pray to such a god that means god basically knows everything so whatever we want god should be uh, able to um, fulfill those god knows what we want so why why even bother to pray uh, and he takes this this to be a discussion of free will he takes it in the direction of free will why do anything why why, why take the initiative or can you take the initiative in doing anything and in that article it's an uh, in an essay he first discusses the prevalent theories of free will so there are three categories of theories three groups of theories one is what is called deterministic theories deterministic theories are um, there you see everything is under strict causality at least in classical physics so in this universe there is cause and effect if you're seeing something it's an effect it must have had a cause and therefore if you are seeing human action what we are doing it must have had a cause so i decide whether i shall raise this bottle of glass or not i'm going to decide i decided now i'm i decided i will raise it and i raised it so the behind this action is the physical action of this body uh, subtler than that is the action of the nervous system subtler than that is some kind of neuronal activity going on in the brain subtler than that and we don't know where the connection is this conscious thought that i will raise this bottle of water but science will tell us that this is not free you think you're free it is not free even this thought which came up that should i raise the bottle of water or not where did it come up from that i have no control over and not only that when i decided yes i will raise the bottle of water did i decide or did the decision bubble up in my conscious mind and then i raised the bottle of water so it is strictly um, causal so that's called deterministic every if every particle in the universe and every, the position of every particle in the universe is is determined by previous um, cause and effect in fact in a simplistic view of this theory everything since the big bang has been determined has been determined so all our human actions which are physical actions in a physical universe how is it that only our actions only our movements in a universe which is determined by cause and effect how can it be free that means it's up to us to decide what i'll do next but every particle you can trace back its activity uh, based on what happened in a, into a previous state and so on so this is one school of uh, physics and you can argue again there is is it if you go deeper into quantum mechanics is it determined or is it probabilistic and so on um then there's another group of theories of free will which says no 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 we have we are free they are called libertarian theories and not one but multiple theories of free will are there we are actually free and they they argue they have got arguments against the scientific view also against strict determinism their arguments even the physical universe is not strictly determined according to latest physics maybe then there are compatibilist views that um, free will is compatible with strict determinism how so so for example um for example just this example which i said of raising the bottle of water now these compatibilist theories say that you had freedom to decide whether to raise the bottle of water or not but the action of raising the bottle of water determines uh, it depends on a strict determination of the activities of your nervous system the musculature of your body and uh, the way physics operates in this universe the laws of physics the bottle being what it is your hand obeying the nervous system's commands and the nervous system obeying the brain's activity all these are strictly determined and your freedom in acting depends on the strict determinism imagine if a classic example of a stroke now i can't control this hand i can't control it what i will the my intentions are not reflected in the activity of this hand suppose it's shaking or it's not controllable 
Is this freedom or is this a lack of freedom? You will say it's a lack of freedom actually. Because the strict determinism, this control over the hand broke down, then my freedom is limited. Now I can't act freely anymore. So freedom depends on, another more subtle example they give is mathematics. So the freedom of the mathematician to come up with new insights and new theorems and prove them depends on a set of strictly fixed axioms to begin with. If you can't, if the game is not clearly defined, you have no freedom of playing the game anymore. So this is compatibilist theories. Now what Professor Arendam Chakravarti does, he brings in the view of Indian philosophy there, especially Kashmiri Shaivism, um, uh, Bhakti, Vaishnava uh, theology and Advaita Vedanta, he brings it in there. And then he says there, uh, to summarize a brilliant article, three levels. First level, on our day-to-day -day, uh, activity, we have free will. We have to assume it because all our activity is based on that at least a little bit of freedom we have got. That's why all this advertisement is there. In order to influence our free will, uh, that's why, uh, you know, uh, so that we will pick the product that is this, they want us to pick. All the entire legal system, the criminal system, justice system in, uh, in our world, it all assumes free will. You cannot be punished for something you are not free to do. If I freely did something which is mischievous and naughty, then I can be punished for it. But how can you punish me if I am, if I come, if I plead that I am not free? In fact, one of the legal defenses is to plead limited freedom of action, for example, under duress, under duress medical conditions, um, um, you know, could extend insanity, it could extend to childhood abuse, it could extend to so many things, uh, acting under the influence of um, uh, drugs or something like that. Uh, substance abuse, whatever. It could extend to so many things, depending on how much the particular legal system will permit. I could argue that I did something bad because a gun was pointed at my head. Almost every legal system will say, will give me some leeway there. I could argue uh, that I was bad because my mom spanked me when I was, when I was a kid. <laughs> now, most judges will not allow that. So, um, so that's um, at our day-to-day -day level, level common sense. Common sense means the world, the world we live in basically without being too philosophical or scientific about it. We all accept free will. So that's stage one. We accept free will. Then stage two, when you investigate, I'm summarizing what the philosopher said. When we investigate in some depth, whether philosophically or scientifically, you begin to question whether free will is at all possible or not. Under investigation. Still, practical life continues, assuming free will. And um, then the third level is that there is freedom. If not free will, there is freedom. Freedom from causality, freedom from nature, what is called moksha, nirvana, whatever it is. Um, then how do we apply this, this idea? It says, that you recognize that you have an illusion or at least a feeling of free will. One, in reality you may not have free will. And three, the third level is when you put them together, I use the freedom of free, this the illusion of free will or the feeling that I've got free will to keep on acknowledging and that is the best use of this, um, this free will, to keep on acknowledging that it is all thou, my Lord, not me. It's a very beautiful conclusion. The best use of free, of free will is to freely acknowledge that I'm not free. And, and not free in the sense, it's the Lord who does everything. And therefore, the answer to the original question, why pray to a God who knows everything? <laughs> That's the, God knows everything, but yet you pray. This is the, the whole idea of, and knock and it shall be uh, open to you. Ask and you shall receive uh, that idea. God knows what we need, but we need to ask for it. And that asking for it is the best use of this so-called quote-unquote free will. Anyway, uh, let, let us start. We should not delay any further. Um, before, so we need to finish by 4.30, let's see. We, we are starting. Uh, half an hour late, so we'll finish at 4.30. Let me...
All right, let's start with the OM. So that will mark the formal start of the session, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, devotion and Advaita, Bhakti and Advaita Vedanta. Let us chant OM together um, at your own pace. OM. About 16 years ago, 17 years actually, I was in the Himalayas in Gangotri and staying in this uh, um, little cottage on the bank of the Ganga. Spectacular scenery, towering mountains all around, and the uh, Deodar forests, and uh, nice, lazy life in the sense that the only thing that I had to do was twice a day I'd go to beg for my food. You know, it's not as difficult as it sounds. There are what are called anakshetras where monks are fed. So you can go there and uh, they will feed you. And that's also very nice, you know. I, I don't know, it might be even more nicer than the dining hall of the Double Tree Hotel or something. <laughs> so you're sitting out there and on the, it's, um, the, it's, it's a courtyard. It's uh, not exactly the, the soil, it's a packed clay, let us say, sitting on that, and uh, you're served on plates. There are uh, volunteers and devotees who serve the food to the visiting monks, and it's open air, and you're treated to this. I still can't forget the magnificent scenery of, of these these the true giants, the Himalayan giants, shooting up right before you to the heights of um, 18, 19, 20,000 feet, and uh, it was summer. So there was no snow where we were sitting, but you could see the glaciers running down at the top. So there, I took this book. I always take, um, I had an earlier older copy, which is well worn out and torn. Um, and I, I would, so when I traveled, I took only one book with me, Dashtavakra. And I would study and meditate. And the only twice a day you go for food, and that's it. There's a saying, that to be a sadhu, a wandering monk, uh, that yet I forgot the exact thing. It's like days, a ghanta fakir or baki samay maharaj. That means <laughs> you are a great king for 23 hours a day, and one hour a day you are a beggar because you go out and beg for food. <laughs> so, now, in the cottage next to my cottage, there lived an old monk, very revered old Swami, Swami Sundarananda. He was, for those of you who know the Chinmay Mission tradition, he was the attendant of Swami Tapovan Maharaj, who was Swami Chinmayanandaji's guru. So Sundaranji used to live next, next let's, let's say next door. <laughs> so it's a very beautiful little kutir, uh, a cottage, which actually was... Um, Swami Tapovan, Tapovan Maharaj's cottage. It's called Hiranyagar Bhakuti. I hear now it's a nice museum has been made there and all that. But at that time there was no museum. Just a little, little cottage. Very, very beautifully maintained cottage. And beautifully maintained because this old Swami maintained it beautifully. I remember one day there was a storm. And they, in every other ashram, ashram means there were little cottages. They were, um, and they, those cottages are real cottages. They are not like, um, you know, uh, boutique cottages, which are meant to look like cottages, but with all facilities. No, nothing. It's just a wooden house. Uh, and inside, there's nothing. There's a wooden floor. There's no furniture, no beds, no, no chair, table, nothing. No electricity. Um, you get two old blankets for your bed and two old blankets to put over you. And that's it. 
And those blankets are older than I am, I think it was. <laughs> so come on in. I think there are, if you have empty seats near you, raise your hand. Uh, so that, yeah, you can come there. There, there. there are empty seats here. And there, there, are, there are two there, yeah. So I made friends with this uh, very respected old Swami. So Naranji was the sevak, the attendant for Swami Tapovan Maharaj. And that's a long story. He told me so many wonderful stories about uh, Tapovan Swami. Now, he asked me, what are you reading? So, what are you reading? I showed him this book. I've got this. And he said, that's very good. But then he went inside his cottage and he bought out a book. Aapko Read this also. You will be haunted by loneliness. The solitude will begin to haunt you. The other book he gave me was Vishnu Sahasranama. An analysis of the thousand names of Vishnu. A devotional text. Uh, it's a wise thing for the both to go to. It seems contradictory. If, on one hand you are saying, I am God. And then on the other hand you, you are uh, worshipping God, you are praying to God. Why? No, it's not contradictory. You are saying in your real nature, in, you are one with the Absolute. We'll see that tomorrow, actually. But in one with the Absolute. But also acknowledge that you are a spiritual seeker right now. You are still very much, it feels like being a person em embodied in a particular body. Uh, you still need to go out, even if you're begging for food, you have to you go out and beg for food. You need that food. You need, even if it's a little hut in the icy coldness there, it's still you need that hut. Even that old tarn blankets, you need that much also. So you are definitely an embodied individual being. So acknowledge that. And devotion. So devotion, jnana and bhakti together. Also note that all these great jnanis, Ramana Maharshi, Vivekananda, Tapavan Maharaj himself, um, they were also great devotees. I'll tell you a story. This, this uh, Sundaranji told me about uh, his guru, Tapavan Maharaj, uh, that what the, he days to wander in the high Himalayas. In fact, Apuanji has a book, Wandering in the Himalayas. So one day they had gone to Gomuk, the source of the Ganga. At that time, it was a much more substantial glacier. And Tapuvan Maharaj was worshipping Ganga, the source of the Ganga, chanting hymns. And Sundaranda was, had, was there as the attendant. He was carrying flowers and other items of worship, incense and all that. And imagine in that icy height. And he said, it is, he told me personally, he said, as Tapavan Maharaj was offering the flowers into the glacier and chanting, then he turned to me for more flowers. And as he turned to me, he was a very tall man. So he turned to me, Sundaranji says, I looked up at him and I saw tears in his eyes. And he, he told me that uh, I was wonderstruck. Itne bade jnani or aankh mein asu. Such a great jnani, huh? uh, person of knowledge, non-dualist. And with tears in his eyes, worshipping the Ganga. So, another monk I knew who stayed in the cottage next to mine. He has passed now, Brahma Chaitanya. Non-dualist. All his life in the Mahai mountains, what he did was for the decades he lived there, all the time he was reading Yoga Vashishta, a book of radical non-dualism like this. But with, men, with much, with much bigger, it's a vast book. It's stories and stuff like that also. Yoga Vashishta. And he was translating from English to, uh, from Sanskrit to English. He had these old notebooks in which he would translate from Sanskrit to English. And when he would complete the translation, that's interesting. When you complete the translation, he would take the bundle of notebooks and go and throw it into the Ganga. And then start all over again for the next few years. So he was not doing it to publish it. In fact, a publisher, well-known publisher, sent agents, after the Swami died, they sent agents to make a thorough search of his hut, if they could find anything to publish. You know? But anyway, they couldn't, as far as I know. So he was just doing that to keep his mind on that. And he told me, it was also an interesting story, why I went to Gangotri twice, but I never went to Gomuk. Once I set out to go to Gomuk, and um, there was a monk who, want, who was going to be my guide. I said, it usually takes two to three days. You go there, stay overnight, come back. And there's a place in between, you stop. So this monk said, I can go and take you and come, come back in within one day. We we'll start early in the morning, we'll be back by nightfall to the glacier and back. I know the shortcut. Just come with a, get a stick, 
big uh, stout stick and come, come with me. So I was about to leave and this Brahma Chaitan was sitting there translating his book early in the morning. You know, first ray of sunlight, he would be out. Kaha chale? Where are you going? I said, I'm going to go mook with that monk. You know, this monk, he told me he'll take me by a special mountain route. He said, wo kar paega, aapka tang toot jayega. <laughs> he can do it, you're going to break a leg. <laughs> so don't go. And then he told me, see, these are people who have the greatest reverence for the Ganga. He said to me, uh, where are you going to see a dirty glacier? You stay here and meditate and study. That's what you have come for. And then he pointed to the books. Asli baat to yahan hai. The real thing is here in the Yoga Vashishta. This person, such a non-dualist. And because of that, I didn't go to Gomukh. <laughs> Every night, as after the sunset, he would retire into his hut, as we all did, because it was dark. And there's nothing else to do. It's just howling cold wind outside. So you go back into your hut, and no electricity or anything. And uh, all you can do, and you don't feel sleepy also. They haven't done any work all day long. And uh, it's just light food which you get there. And it's very nice. It was not terribly cold. It was very pleasant. Uh, so you're wide awake. And in total, in total darkness, you can't even see your own hand. Only thing you could see was sometimes the static electricity jumping from the woolen clothes. That's all you could see. And you can't open a window or anything. There was no light outside. There was no electricity at that time outside there. Um, and if you, you can't open a window, it's like having... Uh, um, a couple of air conditioners blasting in your face because there's cold wind coming in from outside. So you sit there in the dark until sunrise. Now, so you're forced to meditate. That's why I think Himalayan monks meditate so much. <laughs> I made arrangements for, because I, I love reading. So what I did was uh, I got candles from a shop near the temple. There's a temple up to the Ganga. So there are little shops nearby. So I got candles. And I arranged candles in a circle and I would put the book. I was studying Mandukya Karika also by that time. I would put the book in the um, center and study. Until one, another monk saw this, he heard of this, and he said, you're going to spoil your eyes, Swami. Um, if you insist on studying, then he, he was so kind. He cleaned out an old lantern and filled up kerosene in it and he gave it to me. So I would study by kerosene light in the night. Um, so under those conditions, and as evening fell, I would hear this other monk, Brahma Chaitan, the one who said, don't go to that glacier, study here, that is the real thing here. That monk, that non-dualist monk, in the next hut, I could hear the faint voice over the wind, Narayan, Narayan, Srimad, Narayan, Narayan, continuing, hour after hour, until he probably got tired and fell asleep. Narayan, Narayan, Srimad, Narayan, Narayan, just that chanting, on and on and on. Who is saying this? That Aham Brahmasmi monk, huh? Yoga Vashishta. So this combination of, even in this book, I keep this little prayer. Sri Ramakrishna teaching his disciples how to pray. So there's a beautiful English translation. How to pray to God. For him, God was always mother, Sri Ramakrishna. Here is the prayer. O oh Mother, I throw myself on thy mercy. I take shelter at thy hallowed feet. Be gracious and grant that I may have pure love for thee, a love unsmitten by cravings for earthly things, untainted by any selfish end, a love desired by the devotee for the sake of love alone. And grant me the favor, O oh Mother, that I may not be deluded by thy world bewitching Maya. There is no one but thee whom I may call my own. <coughs> Mother, I do not know how to worship. I am without any austerity. I have neither devotion nor knowledge. Be gracious, Mother, and out of thy infinite mercy, grant me love for thy lotus feet. And I keep this prayer. In Ashtavakra Sanghita. So these two should go together. Remember this. All right. This is a wholesome and safe path together. Now, let us chant the two verses we did. Natvam deho nate deho Natvam deho nate deho Bhokta karta navabhavan 
भक्ताकर्ता न वा भवा चिद्रूपोषे सदा साक्षी चिद्रूपोषे सदा साक्षी निरपेक्ष सुखम चर निरपेक्ष सुखम चर रागद्वेशो मनोधर्म रागद्वेशो मनोधर्म नमनस्ते कदाचन नमनस्ते कदाचन निर्विकल्पोसी बोधात्मा निर्विकल्पोसी बोधात्मा निर्विकार सुखम चर निर्विकार सुखम चर Uh, by Ram's translation, you are not your body. Your body is not you. You are not yours. You are not the doer. You are not the enjoyer or sufferer. You are pure awareness, the witness of all things. You are without expectation, free. Wherever you go, be happy. Desire and aversion are of the mind. The mind is never yours. You are free of its turmoil. You are awareness itself, never changing. Wherever you go. be happy there's one thing i wanted to add here what one sadhu said i'll tell you in hindi and translate vedant pratiti ko mitane ke liye nahi hai vedant is not for wiping out the experience of the world vedant aapko vyavahar mein nirbad banata hai vedant makes you fearless limitless in action in the midst of this world See, there's one kind of spirituality which seeks to erase the experience of the world. You know this, and often people mistake Vedanta for this. When you are not the shut out the external world, not the body, not the mind, the peace of one unwavering pure consciousness. Oh, that must be Vedanta. And this, no, oh, this is I've lost it. I have to go back there. No, 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 no. This is Vedanta. Here, Vedanta tells you that once you have discovered that. you bring it back here in vedanta not only must you go away you must come back also and when you come back it's an amazing thing this world what about the world it's become a movie now and you are the actor in your own movie so it makes you fearless it makes you enjoy life i'm using the words uh, you know you know enjoy life to the utmost fearlessly happily he says wherever you go, go be happy he doesn't say so you are pure consciousness keep your eyes shut and sit quietly no i open your eyes go out into the world work um, enjoy be a blessing to yourself and to everybody else so that's vedanta to be fearless in life in the midst of life all right now we move on what we did till now i'm uh, sorry to break the news to you is not advaita vedanta or whatever we have done in the first two sessions no it is nothing more than sankhya it's a dualism of consciousness and object that's what we achieved right the seer and the seen are different the seer and the seen are different and i am consciousness now we are left with two big questions <coughs> what sorry we are left with two big questions one question is all right i am not the body mind i am consciousness but what about all these people there are so many bodies here and presumably so many minds discounting the zombies huh there's <laughs> it's so many minds how many consciousnesses so it could be possible yeah you know vedanta that's why you're saying one but we instinctively feel that there there, there are so many consciousnesses you know like um, so just like i am body mind and consciousness so there's also body mind different body different mind so different consciousness that might be one question how many consciousnesses and the second question would be and what about the world itself and forget consciousness the world is there billions and billions of entities stars planets and tiny particles living bodies of various various types from the blue whale to the coronavirus it's an extraordinary range of living entities and non living entities like these and 
So what about all this? Where is non-duality? Advaita is non-duality. This is plurality. This is a massive amount of diversity. So where is this non-duality? How are they? Are they all separate really ultimately? Or is, is there a oneness underlying all of this? So these are the two big questions which faces. And now we will see the answer. In verse number 18, Ashtavakra will tell us we are all one consciousness. And verse number 19, he will tell us that the entire universe is one with you. The entire universe is nothing apart from you, the consciousness, you, that one consciousness. So this is a huge step forward, establishing non-duality, Advaitam. Verse 18, Name Bandho, sorry, I'm not, I'm doing another chapter. Sarva Bhuteshu Chatma, not verse 18, sorry, verse 6 and 7. I was quoting from another chapter, sorry, sir. Uh, we have done verse 4 and 5, now verses 6 and 7. In verses 6 and 7, non-duality will be established. I was looking at another chapter. Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam, Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam, Sarva Bhutani Chatmani, Sarva Bhutani Chatmani, Vigyaya Nirahankaro, Vigyaya Nirahankaro, Nirmamastvam Sukhi Bhava, Nirmamastvam Sukhi Bhava. Realizing the self in all and all in the self, free from egoism and free from the sense of mind, be happy. Let's see Byram's translation. For see, the self is in all beings and all beings are in the self. This is help with capital S. Self is in all beings and all beings are in the self. Single. Know you are free. Free of I, free of mine. This is a better way of phrasing it. Yes? Free of I, free of mine. Be happy. <laughs> Freed from I and mine, you be happy. Then the next one. So this is establishing we are all one consciousness. Then number seven tells you the universe is one with you and establishes non-duality. Vishwam Spurati Yatredam, Vishwam Spurati Yatredam, Taranga Iva Sagare, Taranga Iva Sagare, Tatvam Eva Nasandeha, Tatvam Eva Nasandeha, Chinmurte Vijwaro Bhava, Chinmurte Vijwaro Bhava. You are indeed that in which the universe manifests itself like waves on the ocean. O oh, you intelligence or O oh, you consciousness, be you free from the fever of the mind. Byram translates this as, seventh verse, in you the worlds arise like waves in the sea. <laughs> the phrasing is so beautiful. In you the worlds arise like waves in the sea. It is true. You are awareness itself. So free yourself from the fever of the world. The original verse just says free yourself from fever. This translation said free yourself from the fever of the mind. He says here free yourself from the fever of this world. Basically, The world and all the worlds that you experience are, they are arising in consciousness like waves in the sea. All right. First, verse number um, six. Sarva bhute shujatmanam, sarva bhutani chatmani. You find this kind of phrasing again and again. The Bhagavad Gita, it's there. In the Isha Upanishad, it's there. Um, the self in all beings and all beings in the self. This is contrary to common sense. Common sense is the self. I, the self, am in this being. And you, that self, is in that being. Each one is a separate self. And we are all separate beings. Here it says, no, we are not separate beings. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Kshetragyam Chapimam Vidhi Sarva Kshetreshu Bharata. In all fields, know me alone to be the knower of the field. In the 13th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna introduced this idea to Arjuna that divide everything into field and knower of the field. It's like what we did, seer and seen. So, whatever you know, this body is the field, 
Krishna says in 13th chapter, idam shariram kaunte akshetram ityabhijayate, uh, ityab etad yo veti kshetragyam tang prahu, tad vidaha. This body, O Arjuna, is called the field. And those, and the one who experiences this body from within is called the knower of the field. So this body is the field. And if you are experiencing it, remember, seer and see, knower and known are different. So you, the experiencer of the body from within, I experience this body. I am different from this body. I am known as the knower of the field. Then the question, same question will arise. So many bodies are there. So are there many knowers of the field? It seems like that. Really, uh, Krishna says, there is only one knower of the field. Kshetragyam chaap imam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata. O Arjuna. In all the fields, all seven billion human beings, all billions and billions of living you know, plant, uh, animals and plants, in all living beings, in all living bodies, know me alone. There is only one knower of the field. Who is that? Pure consciousness, Krishna. Krishna says, I am that, that one consciousness in all living beings. How does this work? How do you claim that it's one consciousness? It doesn't seem like that. So this is the debate between Sankhya and Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta turns the question on its head and says, why do you think there are these separate consciousnesses? I'm reminded of, I think it was Schrodinger who said, consciousness is that singular which has no plural. Uh, so, uh -huh. Eisenberg, I think it was Schrodinger, I'm not sure. One of the scientists, uh, he said, Schrodinger, I think. That singular which has no plural. So, but why? Why do you say that? Why do? Why? Why can't consciousness? Like, why can't there be multiple consciousnesses? After we have completed this analysis, not the body, not the mind, especially separate from the mind. Notice it was. It felt impersonal, just awareness, just like light. The tinge of personality is not there. Once the mind is separated, analyzed. Separated means analyzed separately, understood to be separate from consciousness. So Advaita Vedanta asks the opponent, the Sankhya, why do you think consciousness is um, different in different bodies? Well, the Sankhya replies, it gives some replies, some arguments. Here are some of the arguments. And you will find it very easy to refute. Well, if um, consciousness were the same in each body, uh, then the birth of one would be the birth of all. When one body dies, then everybody would die. The death of one would be the death of all. And the answer to that is very simple. No, 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 it's not consciousness which dies, neither according to Sankhya, nor according to Advaita, or not according to the other philosophies. It's the body which dies. One body could die, another body could be born, other bodies could be living, could be growing from childhood to youth to middle age and older. But consciousness could be the same. Birth, aging, death are of the body, not of consciousness. So multiple bodies could be at different stages and could still be one consciousness in all of them. Um, then the Sankhyan comes back with this idea, that uh, with this argument. No, 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 it cannot be um, one consciousness in all bodies. Because, because um, suppose one person falls asleep, then everybody would fall asleep. If one person is awake, everybody would be awake. And that will be terrible for a Vedanta class because somebody is sleeping. <laughs> in any Vedanta class, it, it's, it's very soporific, especially in the post-lunch session. And that's the main task of the teacher is to keep the audience awake in the post lunch session. Um, then again, the answer to this is very simple. That No, no, waking and dreaming and sleeping are functions of the mind, not consciousness. So in this, this body, that mind could be awake and consciousness is illumining the alert mind. In that one, it might be struggling to be awake. And in a third body, the mind might have gone off to sleep. Consciousness is illumining the sleeping or dreaming mind there. Consciousness can be one without, with the minds being variously awake or dreaming or sleeping or meditating or whatever, right? So sometimes sleeping and meditating very difficult to distinguish. <laughs> Uttarakhand, Vedanta class is going on. In, in Hindi it sounds very funny. So the class is going on and you hear a soft snoring. In, in, <laughs> and the sadhu, sadhu was teaching, monk, he said, Kya wa Mishra ji? When this gentleman, he suddenly comes <laughs> startled, he comes up and he says, uh, and I mean, I'll translate it in English, there's a snoring and the monk asks, 
well mr mishra what what's what's wrong well, what's up and this gentleman comes to with a start and says in hindi he said eh tanik samadhi lag gayi thi i i was in samadhi <laughs> now if if it is one consciousness means if one person goes into samadhi everybody will go into samadhi then very difficult in a class however vedanta says that no waking dreaming deep sleep uh, meditation whatever it is these are functions of the mind there can be only one consciousness behind all of it and it's um, still one mind could be sleeping one mind could be uh, awake and listening one mind could be meditating so it's possible what else then another argument the sankhyans give they give a series of such arguments one argument the sankhyans give is that uh, um how would you explain if the one consciousness that one is born as a human being one is born as an animal and one is born as so it's so different but what is different is the body the hardware and the mind which functions at that level uh, you know one question here might be what is it that goes from body to body in in uh, multiple lifetimes so it's the mind which goes the subtle body it's like the software or the data being transferred now somebody might ask so if it's this mind and in next it goes into an elephant's body or uh, a dog's body or something like that it would sh- should still be a very well trained vedantic mind in the dog's body <laughs> but we don't see that it doesn't seem to be like that the reason again is that the mind is not entirely independent very clearly we have seen it there is a strong correlation with the brain so depending on the hardware that is provided to it and the mind will function up to that level only even in this body the mind has different functionality throughout the age of throughout the lifetime of one body as the physical body deteriorates ages the same mind like the philosopher said mind is failing i, I can't recall anything anymore and so on so it's like your uh, operating system with apps and all if you transfer your operating system into a lower end machine some of the apps will stop working yeah. the performance will be degraded you transfer it into a very high end uh, hardware many more things it will be able to do which is the same software only some capacities become potential at lesser so this is the way the people exp- i mean in hinduism buddhism jainism you explain um, punarjanma the multiple lifetimes so sankhyan question would be how is it one consciousness in multiple bodies one is an animal body one is a snake body insect body uh, and a human body they talk about devata sharira being born as gods in various heavens god with a small g again the answer is very easy the difference is in the hardware the physical body and the consequent difference in the mind also we connected to this physical body but consciousness could be the same in all these multiple bodies why 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 should consciousness just what is consciousness is just that capacity for first person experience just that light which illumines all of what you are arguing my dear sankhya is object is at the level of body mind the final argument the sankhya makes is that no 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 you cannot have one consciousness in all bodies because then the the consequence will be if one being is enlightened then all will be enlightened that would be great but it doesn't happen my guru can be enlightened and i am not enlightened that's why i am a student and the guru is uh, the guru uh, so if one being is enlightened it doesn't everybody doesn't become enlightened but again what what will we argue ignorance and enlightenment are at the level of the mind then atman or brahman is not ignorant or enlightened it just is so ignorance about the atman our real nature is in the mind and that is removed by knowledge about our real nature knowledge removes ignorance just like a little bit of patch of cloud being blown away by a gust of strong wind the sun was unaffected the sun was like always the same it was so similarly consciousness need not be divided into multiple bodies and minds as separate bodies and minds as separate consciousnesses it is one consciousness you have not been able to demonstrate a case for separate consciousnesses and logically also think about it um bodies clearly are different you can see take a uh, um, census and you count millions and billions of bodies minds are also different take an opinion poll and you will find different opinions and ideas and knowledge levels and so on and so forth so minds are also different but that does not differentiate consciousness because after all look at the exercise which we did not the body not the mind 
Consciousness is just the awareness, even when the mind is shut down. That awareness which illumines the mind. Another um, argument would be for one consciousness. Notice our own experience, all of us. Our waking experiences are very different from each other. Our dreams are also very different from each other. But our deep sleep experience is exactly the same. All of us, whoever we are, however old we are, from a baby to a, a like a person who is a centenarian, 100 years old, however knowledgeable or not knowledgeable we are, from grades, uh, kindergarten to a PhD student, um, male, female, whatever we are, all our deep sleep experience is exactly the same. What difference could there be in uniform blankness? Uniform blankness is uniform blankness. It's a pretty impersonal experience, blank. And we're talking about that which illumines that blankness, consciousness which illumines that absence. That is completely impersonal. So what difference, what gradations of difference could there be in consciousness itself? However, here some, a little refinement of the theory is necessary so that we understand what Vedanta talks about. How is it that we are aware now? How are we experiencing all of this, seeing, hearing? We, we have these conscious experiences all the time. So I'm introducing the concept of reflected consciousness. Chidabhasa. The idea is this. You are awareness. You are pure consciousness. And the mind, and the mind has a peculiar, okay, so you are pure consciousness and to you the world of universe of objects appears. Now among all these objects, there is one peculiar kind of object called a mind. What does it do? It's an object. But what does it do? It can capture your reflection. It's like mirrors. You see all these things, the wall and everything you can see, but if there is a mirror, there's also an object, but it does something peculiar. It reflects your face back to you. Right? The mind, because they say because of its sattvic nature, can capture, channelize, um, reflect consciousness. There are multiple theories of this called Pratibhimba Vada, Vacheda Vada, and then um, um, Abhasa Vada, multiple theories are there. But anyway, the idea is this. And one example that I developed just a few weeks ago is this. <laughs> there are many objects, you know. The flower, our friend, the flower is an object. You see it, yep. Okay, it's an object. Microphone is an object. The um, Swami, the Swami's body at least is an object. This phone, but when I do this, what does this object do? It reflects your face back to you. You can see that? Huh? Oh, my, oh, my, my face, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, now it does. Now it reflects your face back to you. It's a good example. It's also just an object just like this. It's a material object. But it is a camera, so it reflects your face back to you. Similarly, what consciousness, uh, what the mind does is, it reflects consciousness. It's like a mirror which reflects your face. And it acts a little bit like consciousness. Uh, so like a shiny surface. It can reflect light. And just like light illumines things, that shiny surface can also uh, illumine things. In like a mirror, it can flash light um, like that. So the example is this. There is a sun in the sky. And there are numerous pots of water in the uh, garden. And in each pot of water, there is water. And in the water, you will see a little sun reflected there. Flashing reflected there. And it is a little bit like the real sun. Because it flashes and it can illumine a little, little uh, space around itself. So the sun is, this is an example, the sun is the Atman, the pot is the physical body, the water is the mind, and the little sun reflected there, the little uh, glimmering little sun is called the Chidabhasa, reflected consciousness, shadow consciousness. It's, the, it's just the water, it's just the water. It's not really that, but, it's, but it acts like the real sun. It's a curious mixture of water, and sun and reflected sun. What's happening right there? Similarly, the consciousness which we feel in our minds just now. So when, when we say, I am consciousness, is it this consciousness I'm feeling? This is the reflected consciousness. This is the reflected consciousness which we are feeling right now. And this is the functional consciousness which does all sorts of things for us. 
So when I see this flower, what happens is um, this information is transmitted to my eyes, uh, the light is, trans is reflected there, then it races along my optic nerve to the brain, and then from there to the mind, nobody knows how. Well, what exactly is the mind in relation to the brain, nobody knows. I mean, in, in modern science. So an image, image means a representation of this flower is formed in the mind. And the reflected consciousness in the mind illumines that. And then we get to experience, I am seeing a flower. This is what's happening. And this is perfectly according to modern physiology and science. This is what modern science also says. You are not literally, the flower is not going thankfully into your eyes. Only light goes. Neither this microphone, nor the flower, nor anything goes into your eyes. Our eyes only collect light, reflected light. And that also, light is also not there. The next moment, it's like tiny bits of electricity racing along our neurons um, in the brain, from the eyes, optic nerves racing along to the brain. It's trans, you know, little bit of little bit of electrical activity. That's all that there is. And from there, it becomes a thought, a perception in the brain. Um, in Sanskrit, it is called vritti, chitta vritti. A vritti means a movement. A movement in the mind with its content. What is the content? A flower. And the reflected consciousness in that mind illumines that vritti and we get the experience, I am seeing a flower. That is called seeing a flower. Okay. So that is reflected consciousness. So it is, but the Ashtavakra is telling us in all the pots, and the pots are many, the water in the pots is many, and the reflected suns in each pot is many. So the reflected consciousness is many. Siddhavasa, reflected consciousness is many. And it comes and goes with the mind. If the mind falls asleep, then the reflected consciousness also disappears. For the while, for the time being. Um, but the sun in the sky is one. So that is the one consciousness reflected in many, many minds as different. Con it appears to be different, but it is actually one consciousness. Now he goes further. The first, this is all I was explaining was. Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam. In all beings is the same self. What does it mean? The same self like the sun in the sky being one. And in all beings, in the mind, it is reflected as reflected consciousness. And then it, we feel like separate sentient beings. Then, at this stage, there is a temptation to think, I am the reflected consciousness. No, you are not. You are the sun in the sky. Not the little sun glimmering in the pot of water. This is Example can be extended a little further. When the pot breaks, the gardener can come and pour the water in a new pot. So the water travels. And when the water travels, the little reflected sun will travel along with it. So exactly like that, when the physical body is destroyed, this subtle body migrates to a new physical body. That's what's called Punarjanma. And the reflected consciousness travels with it. And that which was attached to one physical body earlier, one pot earlier, now gets attached to another pot. But you, the sun in the sky, you're not attached to any part. You have nothing to do with that, actually. You are the only, you are shining, and all this is happening because of that shining. All right. Now, a little further. Pots, water, garden, reflected consciousness, they are all separate from the sun. The sun is separate. So, this example cannot be stretched too far. It's still not non dual. It's a very dualistic example, very Sankhyan example, except that in Sankhya, there are multiple consciousnesses. In this example, consciousness is unified into one consciousness with the help of the reflection theory. This also explains, by the way, somebody might say, how is it that um, the number of human beings, uh, conscious beings is increasing, the population is increasing, where are they all coming from? This is a question which comes up. Can the number of jivas increase in Advaita Vedanta? In traditional, uh, you know, in Sankhya and all, they are all eternal. Um, there are multiple answers to this. I'll give you one answer which is pretty logical. You're sitting in a barber shop. And you have mirrors all around you. As many mirrors, so many reflected faces. How many real faces? One. Unless you are two-faced. Even then it's one face. <laughs> so there's one face. And multiple uh, reflected faces. And if you add some more mirrors and reflections within reflections, you will have many more reflected faces. The more number of mirrors you add, the more reflected faces you will have. How many real faces? One. So one. Uh, one pure consciousness, limitless consciousness, can be reflected the more uh, bodies and minds you project, the more it can be reflected and can appear as many jivas. 
That is not the traditional Advaitic answer. The traditional Advaitic answer is the Jiva sentient beings are also eternal. They continue along with, with Ishvara and only some are manifested at one time. So, depending on how many bodies are available and all, then you can download them into those bodies. <laughs> if there is a chip shortage, then you won't have so many. <laughs> Supply chain problems, huh? So, initially when the Big Bang, before the universe was created and then the, the planets too hot for life, no um, available bodies. So, all of the jivas remained merged in Maya, in, in, with, in as potentials with Ishwara. As life evolved and living bodies became available, God downloaded some of them. And as more and more bodies become available, more can be manifested. Anyway, what would Ashtavakra say? He would roll his eyes. <laughs> and he would say, pay attention. All of this is, <laughs> I'm going to tell you, these are all appearances. It's a dream. Don't read too much into these stories. Now he goes further. Sarva Bhutani Chatmani, the next part of the phrase. It's not that there is one consciousness reflected in so many bodies and minds. Rather, so many um, beings, sentient beings are appearing in one consciousness, like our dreams. I am shifting the sun and pot and clay, what reflected uh, um, uh, consciousness, I am shifting that uh, example to dream example now. In dreams, when we go fall asleep, we forget that we are dreaming and we, we are in a dream world and in the dream world, you are there and many other people are also there. A lot of people are coming and going, some you know, some you don't know, some you interact with, some are nice, some are mean and so on and so forth. And yet, they are all nothing other than you, the dreamer. Sarva Bhutani Chatmani. When you wake up, what do you realize? I in the dream and indeed everybody else in the dream. People I liked, people I did not like, people I did not know, everybody else in the dream was nothing other than I. They were all appearing in me. Sarva Bhutani Chatmani. Another example I like, really like is the wave and ocean example. So imagine what's the ocean and how far are we away from the ocean? Atlantic? Three or four. Okay. So on the Atlantic coast, you go out there, you see thousands and thousands of waves rising and falling and rushing towards the shore. And imagine out there in the ocean, a little wave is born. It comes up and it sees other little waves around it. And um, then it maybe goes to wave school and makes <laughs> friends with some of the waves. Some of the waves are nice to it. Some, some of the waves, little waves, some of the little waves are mean to it. It gets its own friends, its own group. And, and then it looks up and sees some huge waves and is, you know, Wow, that's amazing. Can I grow up to be like that? Uh, or I'm so small. And then it says, sees other waves who are smaller than it and thinks, what a loser. And, <laughs> and in this way, a kind of wave, samsara comes up and it goes on. And, and they all go along together. After some time, it sees something's happening out there. What's that? That's the United States. That's the shore, Atlantic shore. Oh. And what's happening there? Well, that's the place all waves go to die. <laughs> and the wave says, what? Am I going to die there? Yeah, we, that's, that's what happens to us. We all go there and we dash against it into the shore and we burst into spray and foam and surf and we die. And that's the destination of all waves. Oh God, the little wave thinks, my God, uh, I'm going to die. Now, along with it comes this Vedantic wave. <laughs> And it says, you know something, I'll tell you something interesting. It's true that waves die, but you are not a wave. <laughs> oh, I'm not? You are water. You are water. And uh, water doesn't die. You smash against the rocks and you lose the wave form. and You burst into a million drops of spray, but it's all water. You're still there as water as spray, as foam, as in, in fact, when you go up as droplets rising to the sky in masses of clouds above, it's still water. You do not die. Water does not die. And the little wave thought, wow, so I don't die. No. And in fact, everybody else is also water. You're not only immortal, you're also the same as everybody else. 
the so called big wave which you were envious of this water this you and a little wave you are contempt you are full of contempt about that's you is that exactly you the same water and when you contemplate yourself as water but wait wait how do i know i'm water well you meditate deep inside you there's something called water <laughs> and when he gets it realizes oh not just deep inside me the top of me is water the middle of me is water and beneath me is water and on all sides of me is water and then you look a little further the distinction between you and the next wave disappears where is the limit wave to wave you can think of a limit this is one wave that's another wave but water this side is water that side is water it's one limitless expanse of water every wave is you the water indeed the entire ocean god huh, is water and so there is no death for you no sense of envy or contempt in you you are one with everybody all the waves are in you at first it seems you are water in a wave but then you realize when you are water all the waves are in you they arise in you they play about in you they disappear back into you this is what is meant by sarva bhutani ch atman all those thousands of waves they do not constitute a second reality forget thousands they do not constitute a second reality apart from you the water they do not if you count water is it is the wave a second thing apart from water no every bit of it is water all the waves did there may be thousands of waves they do not constitute a second reality apart from you non dual as water you are non dual with regard to the waves in the ocean as a single wave dualistic they are all different and the totality of all the waves is the ocean supremely powerful totality of all sentient beings is god ishvara bhagavan but as satchidananda as existence consciousness bliss you are one reality in all beings sarva bhutani ch atmani vigyaya you have to realize this vigyaya realizing this how shravana manana nididhyasana hear about this contemplate this meditate upon it until it becomes an effortless lived reality it is an effortless lived reality but we are just like that little wave struggling you know it's i sometimes feel that i'm water but mostly i feel i'm a wave <laughs> i have to do water non dual meditation <laughs> until i become water and then the vedantic wave will scold him and say you are water right now every bit of you you know that sounds very profound but that's mostly talk <laughs> i'm actually a wave i'm trying to become water and sometimes i catch a glimpse of myself as water but mostly it's a wave <laughs> when i listen to you i'm water but otherwise i'm a wave <laughs> when i do the guided meditation <laughs> when i do the guided meditation i'm water but otherwise i'm a wave no 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 and then the other question all right suppose but if i just become water can i be a wave because being a wave is fun <laughs> sure you just water and what else is a wave other than water you can retain your wave form as long as you like be a wave as many times as you like be a raindrop as many times as you like be surf and foam and spray as much as you like it's all nothing but you it's your capacity i really don't want to be enlightened and get free this world is fun can i come back again you can there's nothing in this world nobody in this world apart from you as many times as you like i don't want to come back don't so vigyaya realizing this nirahankara nirmama not i not mine so in this individual i and individual mine I mean, there's a lot to be discussed this i and mine but i won't go it into it now and then again sukhi bhava be happy it sounds like the simplest of uh, new age uh, slogans be happy what don't worry be happy hmm? there was a song happy song farrel yeah right sounds like that ashtavakra is that very ancient <laughs> happy song be happy you don't have to shut down anything then next all right so all beings are one consciousness but what about the bodies of these beings what about non living things what about quasars and quarks uh, what about stars and planets what about space and time next seventh verse 
we did this. Vishwam spurati yatredam tarangai vasagare. Seventh verse. Tattvam asi, tattvam eva nasandeha. The, you are this one consciousness in which the entire universe appears. All right. Not only that the consciousness in all beings is one consciousness, but the minds and the body and the universe which, with, from which we so meticulously distinguished ourselves, they are also nothing but consciousness. He said, Swami, aren't you taking back what you did in the first, uh, we separated ourselves now? All right, here's the crucial key to it all. Again, I'll tell you what the Swami, one of the teachers said in Hindi, but I didn't translate for you. He said in Hindi, in Hindi, ye to theek hai, ki drishya drashta se alag hai. Ki drashta drishya se alag hai, ye to theek hai, drashta drishya se alag hai. Ki ab, ab kabhi soche hai, kya drishya drashta se alag hai. It is true that you, the seer, you are distinct from everything that is seen. The seer and the seen are distinct. It's true. That's what we did. But have you ever thought, what is seen, the object, is it distinct from you? You are distinct from everything that you see in a dream. But those things which you see in the dream, are they different from you? No, they can't exist without you. You are different from the dream means you can exist. You, can have, you wake up from the dream and you are there. But all the things which appeared to you in the dream, you are different from them. You exist without them also. The words of the dream, the people in the dream, the things in the dream, they all disappear. You are fine. You exist. But can they exist without you? No. Drashta to drishya se alag hai. So, theek hai. Lekin drishya kya drashta se alag hai? The seer is different from the seen. Correct. That part of the analysis was correct. But the other part, have you ever thought about it? What is seen, whatever you experience as an object, is it different from the consciousness? By different I mean, can it exist independently of consciousness? Here we are entering into profound waters, the whole philosophical tangle of realism, idealism, all of that. Let me give you a little story which will illustrate what I mean or what Ashtavakra means. So the gentleman I told you about, Bill, who is 99 years old, he is a physicist, he is a World War, Second World War veteran, he used to fly bombers of the Pacific Theater. Quite a character. And he's a commit, committed realist. Said, Swami, it's not true that the universe exists in your consciousness or in our consciousness. The universe exists and we come to it as conscious being and we experience it. Common sense view. The world is out there. The Double Tree uh, Hotel is there and then we came here and we experienced this. It's not that this is in us. Rather, we are in it. So, that's a body-based view. But, then Bill said, I will prove it to you, Swami. Let's have an experiment. I'll set up this camera, right? And it'll take pictures and both of us will leave the room and then we will come back into the room and then we will see the pictures in the camera. The empty room was there without us. Room is not in our consciousness. We are in the room. It existed when we were not there also. And it'll exist and, it ex and we see it when we come back. When we go away, the room will exist. Similarly, the world exists, whether we see it or not. This is the realist worldview. As against, there is an idealist worldview also. But Advaita is different from both. There's a subtle point. Uh, I'll give you some reference later on. A lot of subtlety there. But let, let me see, tell you what I said to Bill. Bill, I said, in your consciousness, you thought of this experiment. In your awareness. And in your awareness, your consciousness, you set up the camera. In your uh, consciousness, you told me, let's go out of the room, Swami. In your consciousness, we went out of the room. In your consciousness, we came back into the room. In your consciousness, we looked at the pictures in the camera. And in your consciousness, we saw an empty room without any conscious being. At which point did you step out of your consciousness? We don't think in that way. Why we get confused is this. Uh, I'll just give you a hint. A uh, hint and a couple of references. The hint is this. We must make a distinction between knowledge and consciousness. We think that when Advaita is saying everything is in our knowledge. No, it isn't. We know very little. Right now I can see you, but I can't see what's behind me. Now I can see what's behind me. This is within my knowledge and that's outside my knowledge now. I swing around and this is within my knowledge. That's outside my knowledge. 
So our knowledge is very narrow band. With our senses, with our reading, with our science, we know some things. And there are lots of things which we do not know. So always there will be somebody who will ask the question, how can everything be in my consciousness? There is some planet far away, uh, on, on that planet, on the some side of the planet, there is maybe some rock. Do I know that? that how is it in my consciousness? What's going on there in the vast universe? Almost all of it is beyond my knowledge. Then how, do I, how can it be inside my consciousness? No. Knowledge and consciousness are two things. The whole universe of the known and the unknown appears in your consciousness. That's what Advaita Vedanta wants to say. Using the instruments of knowledge, like your sense organs, like your mind, like science and all, you bring some of the unknown into the known. Some of the known might even shift into the unknown. But all of that known, in Sanskrit, Gyatataya, Gyatataya, known and unknown, it appears in consciousness. Example, when we go into a dream world, which you generate, you get the feeling that you are interacting with people, things are happening. And you also have the vague sense of, suppose you are sitting and talking with your friend and having a cup of tea or something. We also have the vague sense of a world around you, other people, things are going on, just like this waking world. And those things you are not seeing, it seems to exist, but you are not seeing that. You never feel in the dream, I am in a strange world, only me and my friend and a cup of tea exists. You never feel that. You feel you are in a, like a world. So the world of your dreams exists for you as known, the friend and the cup of tea, and as a vast unknown. But when you wake up, the known and the unknown were both in your mind. Similarly, in this waking state, all this known, whatever we know, perceptually, intellectually, all of that, and the vast unknown, all of this is appearing in consciousness. You are that consciousness. That's the, that's worth thinking about. How, those who are philosophically trained, how is all this different from uh, idealism, subjective idealism? So the two references I'll give is Shankara's, Shankaracharya's extended critique of Buddhist idealism, Vigyanavada Vedanta. Um, Vigyana, sorry, not <laughs> Vigyanavada Buddhism. Yoga Acharya Vigyanavada. So that's a school of Mahayana Buddhism. Very powerful school. They said that whatever we experience is in our minds. Is in our awareness, not in the Vedantic sense. Just the individual being. What you see is just like a dream. Everything is in, in you. There's no, no external world. No such thing as external. Whatever feels like external is also in the mind. Internal, external, both are in the mind. Just like a dream. Shankara strongly criticizes that. So he maintains a strong sense of the external world, body, mind. Some things are in the mind, some things are out there in the world. All of it is in consciousness of Brahman. This thing he defends. Um, exactly similar critique in an entirely different setting was carried out by Immanuel Kant against the uh, Berkeley, Bishop Berkeley, the subjective idealist, who said something very similar to what the Buddhists had said more than... 1200 years before him, 12, 1500 years before him. So Kant criticized that. So Kant's criticism of Berkeleyan subjective idealism and Shankara's criticism of Buddhist Vigyanavada. Almost similar arguments. There's an article by Professor Arindam Chakravarti, Idealist Refutations of Idealism. Idealist Refutations of Idealism. Why would Shankara attack a Buddhist idealist? Why would Kant attack um, Berkeley, he's also an idealist of a certain sort, attack Berkeley and subjective idealism. It's because of this. Advaita Vedanta does not say that the world is an appearance in your knowledge only. So there's clearly so many things that we don't know. And they exist whether we know it or not. But the whole thing, known and unknown, is an appearance in consciousness. I was reading this book. Uh, anyway, there was a sub, uh, idealist philosopher in England, Bradley, F.H. Bradley. Nobody reads, reads him now. It's out of fashion. Uh, he wrote a book called Appearance and Reality at the turn of the 20th century. Appearance and Reality. Wonderful book. I mean, if you like Vedanta, you'll like that. You'll like the appearance part of it. The reality part of it, he messes up royally. But, <laughs> but his uh, conclusions are so Vedantic. He says, reality is sentient experience. Sentient experience is reality. This, there is a Sanskrit definition of Brahman. Anubhava matra param Brahma. 
can't experience, pure experience is Brahman. What is pure experience? Where consciousness alone in which experience are experienced object and the experience appear and disappear. So these are the references I've given you. One is Shankara's critique of Vijnana Bada Buddhism and one is Kant's criticism of subjective idealism. And both you can find summarized in a beautiful article, Idealist Refutations of Idealism, Professor Arindam Chakravarti. All right. Here we have the entire universe appears and disappears in you as waves in an ocean. All right. Now we should take up some questions because there is very little time remaining. What we will do tomorrow, by the way, what have we um, achieved here? We have achieved non-duality here. If you are the ocean, you are the consciousness in which the entire universe appears and disappears. And the object seen is not different from the seer. In that case, there is no second reality apart from you. You are that one non-dual reality. Congratulations. <laughs> you are Advaitam. You can congratulate yourself. You are the reality of this entire universe. It is because of you that the universe exists or seems to exist. It is because of you that the universe is lit up by experience, Anubhava. You shining, everything else shines here. By your light, everything here is lit up. Okay. One, two, three. I'm going to stop at. Come, come, come. Four, five. Okay. Stop. <laughs> With that gentleman. Yeah, you can come and stop because we won't have time. We are going to be chased out by the staff. I've been given a strict warning here to cut it off at a certain time. All right, we'll start there. Tell us your name and ask the question. And I'll try to be um, concise in the answers. Tell us your name and ask the question. That's a crucial question. How do I differentiate between mind and consciousness? One way would be, can we point to some experience where mind is not there but consciousness is there? In that case, consciousness and mind would be separate. No mind but consciousness is there. Can we think of anything like that? Deep sleep. Why do you say deep sleep? You might say, isn't it the mind ex experiencing its own blankness? But in that case, mind is not uh, is active in that case. See, deep sleep is a state where the mind is not active. And then the mind cannot experience itself. Um, because it's like, when, whenever the mind is active, note, it's of the form of, I know something, or I am aware of something, or I feel something. I and something, that thing is always there. In deep sleep, it's not there. There's no sense of I. I am sleeping. If the mind were active, it would be like, I am experiencing blankness. But the I am experiencing thing is gone altogether. In deep sleep, anesthesia, it's just gone. It's very different from our waking or even from, from dreaming. So the mind is shut down. Now, at that point, many might say, oh, there's no experience. Some say that. But a more subtle look at it will show that it's a kind of experience. In every civilization in the world, the phenomenon of deep sleep is there in every culture. Uh, every culture, there'll be some reference to deep sleep. I uh, slept like a log. I didn't know anything. There's deep sleep. In Bengali, there's a phrase, Ghumiya uh, Kada, slept like mud. <laughs> now, for that, you have to imagine Calcutta or Bengal, which is uh, 100 degrees in the shade and 100% humidity. So, if you go to sleep, you're going to feel like mud when you get up. <laughs> so, slept like mud. Where do these expressions come from in every culture of the world? Uh, unless it is a unique kind of experience. Another... Uh, argument to distinguish mind from consciousness is that look at mental activity. There's an enormous variety of activities. But in all the activities, there's something common. You know what is common in all, all the mental activities? First person experience. 
you drink water. It feels like something to drink water. You see a red rose. It feels like something to see a red rose. Uh, you pinch yourself. It feels like something to pinch yourself. Water, rose, pinching, they all are different from each other. But in every case, there is a first person experience. It feels like something. That is common to everything. So that is unchanging. Now, we say that's also the mind. Then the mind will also will have to be unchanging and changing at the same time. It can give you a variety of experiences and yet be the same all throughout. It makes sense to distinguish a constant sense of first person experience from the objects of experience. That sense of first person experience is given to us by consciousness. And the objects of experience keep changing. Another argument to distinguish mind from consciousness would be artificial intelligence. Notice, every function of our mind is duplicated by artificial intelligence, except consciousness. They, they, they take decisions, they have memory, they can uh, write, compose poems, uh, creativity, do, do every, every kind of activity which we thought human beings could do. They can talk to us and all of that, except they are not aware. There is no first person experience there. On the testimony of the experts, you know, those who designed it. So then we must distinguish consciousness from the mental activities. Then you, that constant mind, you give a different name. You want to call consciousness a constant mind, call it constant mind. The Buddhists call it that. The Buddhists call it the real nature of the mind. Uh, the real nature of the mind and the, you know, the constantly changing mind. Uh, so, the, the real nature of the mind, they, what is the real nature of the mind? We say con existence consciousness and they say emptiness luminosity, which is a beautiful way of putting it. What is the content of the real mind? Nothing, no content, it's emptiness and yet it's luminous and everything else is a content to it. So this basic difference between consciousness and mind is made by some schools of Buddhism, by Sankhya, by Advaita. Think about it, it's logical because this, what, what you, if you call it constant mind, then it must be very different from the non by the, the changing mind. Then give it a different name. The changing mind can entirely stop. Constant mind, by definition of being constant, will not stop. It will continue. Right. Yes, I'll come to you. Yes. yes. My question is very similar. I think we asked a lot of other questions in mind. But, uh, consciousness still seems a bit nebulous, at least from the experiential side of it. Right? It almost seems like you need mind to experience consciousness. Hmm. Like the three periods that they I understand that you mentioned seer can't be seen, but there's also a corollary to that where you can look at it in a mirror or a camera. I, I'm wondering, you know, uh, and also like essentially there's no difference between deep sleep and waking state for the consciousness. So I'm, I'm again struggling to understand that. All right. I think I've got the point. Let me uh, just reply to that. The first thing, consciousness seems nebulous. Whereas universe, the world, body, mind seem very clear. Even the mind seems very clear. Consciousness seems nebulous. You know why it seems nebulous? It does seem nebulous. You know why it seems nebulous? The reason is, for us, what is concrete and real is an object of consciousness. And the very fact that consciousness cannot be objectified, that's what makes it nebulous. That's one answer. Think about it. It's not nebulous. It's like saying... From seeing all these things, I come to the hypothesis, I have eyes. But I can say that, yeah, I mean, I'm very clear. There are people there. I can see people. I can see a bottle of water. I can see the red rose. I can see the hands. I can see the tip of my nose. I can't see my eyes. So this whole theory of eyes, it seems rather <laughs> nebulous. <laughs> but I can see this. I can see that. I can see that. It, it's all because of uh, the, the eyes. It, in one sense, it is more established than anything else. Like Descartes said, that which I'm absolutely sure of, I don't know anything about it. That's why it seems nebulous. And that which I know so many things about, all of it can be doubted. So that's the interesting thing. Because it's not an object, that's why it seems nebulous. Because our tendency to when we know things, we know as object. The tenth man story, if there's a chance, I'll tell you tomorrow. That's why it seems, the second part of the question was, 
Well, given all of that, it still seems that consciousness is dependent on mind. Yes, it's true, but uh, that's the Sankhyan philosophy. That consciousness is dependent on nature and nature is dependent on consciousness. What does consciousness, what does uh, nature do for consciousness? Everything. Thinking, feeling, creativity, walking, talking, enjoying, suffering, everything requires body, mind and world. But what does consciousness do for nature? First person experience, it gives it light. Light, life, meaning, everything is possible because of consciousness. Now Advaita takes it one step forward. Taranga Ivasagare. Like waves in an ocean, what arises in the ocean of consciousness? Mind, body, universe. So, it's not that the consciousness depends on the mind, body and universe for doing things. They depend on consciousness for their very existence. It's like, I am in the dream and I have a body in the dream and a mind in the dream and uh, I experience people and then wake up and say that, yeah, it's true that it was all dreams. Uh, but I, the dreamer, I depended on the dream body and the dream mind to experience the dream world. No, the dream world, body and mind are all appearances of you, the dreamer. They depend entirely upon you. You are like, like a, you know, the phone. Whatever it, we want to do with it, it deploys a variety of apps and does that. Do the, does the phone depend on the apps? In one sense, yes. But the apps actually totally depend on the phone. Yeah, yeah. so that sense. Uh, earlier you said uh, mind is limited by body. So how is it? And of course, uh, are there different amongst uh, humans and you know, animals? So staying with uh, human beings also, are there can be quite different very uh, possible also. So does it mean that um, only certain intelligent people can experience consciousness? No. And, and experience consciousness, everybody ex, ex, quote unquote experiences consciousness. Experiences means all experience is possible because of consciousness. Dr. Anil said, he put it beautifully. Wherever there is reflected consciousness, there is experience. So he put it beautifully. He is a neuroscientist in England. He said, Deep Blue, the computer, which played chess, it's smart, but it cannot suffer. A mouse, comparatively, is not smart, but it can suffer. When a cat catches it, it suffers. So first person experience, experience, which is first person experience. Experience means first person experience. Wherever there is first person experience, human beings, not just intelligent beings, beings which are intelligent like a computer may not have first person experience. Beings which are not at all intelligent, um, an insect, it might have uh, first person, it will have first person experience. So wherever there is consciousness or reflected consciousness, there is experience. Yes. What's your name? Come closer to the mic. I listen to your YouTube feed for the last few years, and I'm, I'm not even sure for long. However, when I try to try this Savana Manana Nidhasana, your guidance, particularly for Nidhasana, not able to focus like Arjuna told, my mind is turbulent and cannot focus. I wise word, practice. So, but when I practice, it seems mostly I am following your feed that mind is busy. That is, I got it from you. So, but sometimes I feel I'm mostly doing the job of my in the entire time. So, do you have any guidance for me? I don't remember the reference to the smiling Buddha. It sounds nice, whatever it is. Then I should not touch it. I should smile in that. That is, that that way you told me. Yeah. Right. So, a regular practice of the, the yogas, karma yoga, bhakti yoga and raja yoga, that is preparatory for Advaita Vedanta. Whenever we come to any Advaita text, not Ashtavakra, but any of the introductory texts, you will first be told about the preliminary practices. So, there is something called sadhan chatushta, fourfold qualifications, they are like entry qualifications. Viveka, the, the, the 
um, discernment of the eternal from the non-eternal, then vairagya, dispassion for the non-eternal. And Sri Ramakrishna gave us positive uh, spin on this. In Bengali he said, Vishaya virag ishwarya anurag, a dispassion for vishaya, for the world, for worldliness, and a pull towards God. And he went God in a dualistic, devotional sense. Then the sixfold uh, disciplines, Shat Sampatti. So that includes Shama, a calmness of the mind, Dhamma, a control of the senses, um, then uh, Titiksha, a spiritual toughness or fortitude, which will allow you to persist in spite of all ups and downs. Then there is um, this uh, Uparati, a withdrawal from too much engagement with the world. Then Samadhana, focus, settling down on Vedanta. Then Shraddha, a deep sustaining faith in the teachings which will take you forward until enlightenment. Then finally there is Mumukshutvam, intense desire to be free. Now whenever we find this problem, I can't focus, um, mind flickers and all. It, it is the lack in this uh, Sadhan Chatushta, the fourfold, fourfold preliminary practices. In other words, you can put it as Karma Yoga. Selfless action, ethical and selfless action. Bhakti yoga, devotion to God in some particular form. In what, in whichever form you are accustomed to, you know, it's a devotional, pious, loving, surrendered mind, which will find Vedanta easier. And then Raja yoga, daily practice of meditation. So these are these preliminary practices. Otherwise, the foundation is shaky. Not just Raja Yoga, there, sh there should also be Bhakti Yoga, there should also be Karma Yoga. Otherwise what happens, just Raja Yoga, just, just meditation, you find mind is wandering, like Arjuna says to Krishna. Yeah, um, we'll go there. Ah, yes, yes. Think about, I'll give you the example, try it. Um, try it, don't over try it, it'll give you a headache. I'll give you a, a, an experiment which you can try. However, um, it's best, the safest to keep on practicing the bhakti, meditation and karma yoga disciplines and keep on listening to the Vedantic teachings. But still, if you want to pre make a direct attack on the problem. It's like this. Imagine the reflected face in the mirror. So the mirror is like the mind. The reflected face is like reflected consciousness. And your real face is here. Now see, just like reflected consciousness, the reflected face is experienceable. You can see it. The reflected consciousness, you can feel it. We can all feel aware. We all feel aware right now. Now the job is to go from that reflected face to the real face. The problem with the real face is you can't see it. The advantage of the real face is it's real, it's you, the real you, but you can't see it. The way you go from the reflected face to the real face is exactly the way you go from reflected awareness to yourself, the real awareness. In that, the helpful teaching is don't try to objectify it. Try to understand whose object, whose or what, what is that which is being reflected in the reflected consciousness. The reflected consciousness, what is that which is being reflected, like the reflected face? You can never see the reflected face, the real face in this way. You can't. The only way you can see the real face as is as a reflection. But you can know that this is my real face. One helpful thing to do there is, just like the mirror, we are now completely engrossed in the mirror and the reflected face and we have forgotten the real face. So the way, how would you help such a person? First of all, strongly tell him, you are not that reflection. You are not that. You are not the mirror. You are not that face. That is a reflection of your real face. Similarly, you are not the body, not the mind, not even the consciousness appearing in the mind. Then, you have to intuitively catch. After that, nothing can. Otherwise, just the, if you try, many people have tried it, they report basically headache. <laughs> it's, it's difficult. Um, it, we make it difficult by trying to objectify our real nature. So that will not work. It's much better to say that I am not this. Neti Neti is better. Otherwise, the mind has a way of trying to 
against all odds trying to objectify uh, what cannot be objectified. It is the very nature of the mind to see thing as an object, see something as an object. Okay. Yes, yes, please. Not um, the what Sri Ramakrishna did was see the same non-dualism where there is an overwhelming emphasis on the transcendent. That you know, let's put it in, the, in terms of real face and reflected face. There's overwhelming importance on the real face, transcendent reality, Nirguna Brahman, and Shankara stops there. But like waves, the waves are also water. Once you realize what water is, but then you have to realize that the waves and the foam and the surf, they are also water, they are same water, literally the same water. So the play of water in this ocean, that is just water. Similarly, this entire universe is nothing other than Brahman. So Brahman is both transcendent, beyond, and immanent, in and through this universe. Swami Vivekananda said, we Hindus worship a transcendent, immanent God. It's a very interesting uh, insight. So the immanence of God, immanence means the presence of God in everything. That was also specially stressed in this day and age by Sri Ramakrishna. Based on that, humanism, service, the harmony of religions, all of these, why? It's only you have to give a little more importance to Shakti in order to do all this. That's why I think practical Vedanta, Otherwise, Shankara's classical Vedanta was enough. Advaita Vedanta is enough to take you to liberation. But this other side of it, making it useful for in this day and age, work as worship, everywhere a little importance, extra importance to Shakti has to be given to the name and form. You have to give importance to the wave. Earlier wave, only as wave, samsara, wave samsara. I will die. That wave is bigger than me. This wave is a little loser. Uh, and I am going to the shore. I will die. All this is wave samsara. Once the wave realizes it is water, then it is freed from the wave samsara. It knows I cannot die. But then it can go on being a wave as long as the wave body lasts and then be surf or spray or whatever and happily be all of that. Like Ashtavakra stresses, Sukham chara, be happy. It doesn't, he doesn't say, hey, you have realized this, now remain in Nirvikalpa Samadhi. That's what Vivekananda wanted to do. Sri Ramakrishna. So the straight answer to your question is, Sri Ramakrishna stressed, Shankara stressed the, the transcendent aspect of uh, Advaita Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna equally stressed the um, immanent and the transcendent, both. And that's why the acceptance of Shakti, especially for the work, the acceptance of Shakti is necessary. All right. Did, oh, one person is there, yes. Mind is not equivalent to consciousness. No, that's what we did all day long. So, yeah. Mind is distinguished. In the first step, you must distinguish consciousness from body, from mind, consciousness by itself. And then see, in the, the final step, we will see how consciousness itself appears as body and mind. Atman is consciousness, yes. Atman is consciousness. As consci Atman, Paramatma, is, tomorrow we will see the distinction between Atma and Paramatma also. But both are consciousness. Consciousness, I am using the English word. The correct word would be uh, Chit or Sat. No. The soul is an ambiguous term. Yeah. Yeah, the real meaning of the soul will be will be pure consciousness. Yeah. All right. So, gentleman here. Namaste. Namaste. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, I have interpreted rebirth and reincarnation, which seems to be a really nice attack point for a lot of uh, people, uh, as what what you were mentioning, subtle body, good 
the reflective consciousness traveling from one, one being to another. Uh, but my question is, so the, the, the consciousness can actually manifest itself when it, when it does this anywhere in the universe. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have to be restricted because it, it is manifested, I mean, it, it is actually manifesting the universe for us. Yes. So it could be known, unknown. Right. So it's not just consciousness itself. The real term for that would be existence consciousness, please, Satchidananda. So look, when it appears as this, this physical universe, stars and planets and all, everywhere you see one thing, existence, is, is, table is, microphone is, flower is. This isness which is common, the very existence of all these things, that comes from Satchidananda, the, the existence aspect. The existence aspect becomes the consciousness also when it comes to the mind, right? It's reflected consciousness. It could be uh, other planets, wherever life is available, it could be anywhere. Um, in Hindu and Buddhist Jain cosmology, you'd speak of multiple worlds, yeah. multiple, many, many universes, multiple universes, multiple worlds, where there are many sentient beings. They talk about it. But notice, Ashtavakra is not very interested in these issues. <laughs> yeah. He say, for him, it's like a movie or a dream. He points you back to your nature as consciousness all the time. The rest of it, one birth or many births, the Abrahamic religions say one life. Hindus, Buddhists, Jains, Sikhs will say many lives. But what does Ashtavakra say? I remember this Swami, he had this uh, big debate about um, is there one life or are there many lives? And then he went to this non-dualist teacher, it was in Uttarkashi, and asked Punar Janma Ek Janma, what is right? And that uh, non-dualist teacher, I'll tell you what he said in Hindi and repeat in English. He said, Are Mahatma ji, jab janma hi nahi, to punar janma kahe ka. He said, Oh, my dear monk, when there is no birth, not even a single birth, how can there be rebirth? Advaita goes the other way. Even one birth is an appearance. It's not really that you have been born. It's a body appears, mind appears, plays around and disappears. Yeah. When did the water become a wave? The water actually never became a wave. Water remained water. You have a name and a form and an activity which you impose on the water and call it a wave. But water remains as water. Consciousness remains as consciousness or Atman remains as Atman. That's what Ashtavakra would say. Yeah. Um, is anybody else there? No. Are you are there? Okay. Namaste Swamiji. Thank you for this uh, wonderful retreat. It seems to me there are two components to the end of suffering. One is the existential component that ends when you have this understanding. And then there's the psychological component. And that is a lifetime's task, right? Because as your mind gets more and more purified, the psychological aspect of it will, of suffering will decrease. But the existential, you know, whether you are calm or whatever, you know that you are the water. And so it seems to me there are two things that happen and one takes a lifetime. Yes, you are right. There was a question earlier about whether it's gradual or, or instantaneous. You're right, it's both. And so once you make the breakthrough, it's instantaneous, you realize it falls into place that you are, it's not only an understanding and that becomes most important that, oh, what's more important to make the mind calm down or to know that you are Brahman, well, regardless of what happens. It's most important to know that you are Brahman, regardless of what happens. And over... Uh, time, the psychological aspect of it, the mind becomes a purer mind, a calmer mind, more capable of manifesting saintly qualities. That's called a Jivan Mukta. So there is a whole analysis, there's a whole book on this called Jivan Mukti Viveka, written by Vidyarinya about 700 years ago, same author who wrote Panchadashi. So there he analyzes what's the difference between being enlightened and a Jivan Mukta. You might call it fully enlightened or a full blown. Um, you know, like a advanced spiritual master who manifests this enlightenment, who can live it, 
who gets all the benefits of being free of sorrow and suffering. So that takes time and that takes practice. But there's a difference between the practice of that enlightened one and the practice before that. For us, we are seeking and we are practicing. Whether it's devotion, meditation, all of this, what we are doing, we are seekers. And once you get that breakthrough, you're no longer a seeker. You found it. But then also practice might continue, which will enable you to psychologically manifest it in your mind and then in your actions and words, the saintly qualities of an enlightened one. Yeah, that takes time. And that's an important project. The last two questions and we'll wrap up. Huh. So I just started that reference. Yeah, the reference is it's um the it's from Vak Devi, the um the Suktam. The Devi Suktam. Uh, a very beautiful hymn which is chanted before Durga Puja, where uh, she identifies with Brahman. Uh, the Vak Ambrini, her name is Vak Ambrini, one of the earliest Rigvedic sages, a lady. And she says, I was there at the beginning of the universe. I means not this particular lady. I as pure consciousness. And as the universe began, I blew through it, through it like a breeze, you know. Uh, so very, very extraordinarily lofty and poetic. So the Devi Suktam, I have a talk on that. If you look it up, the Devi Suktam, I've explained it line by line. And there's a beautiful chanting which is done of the Devi Suktam. It's from the Rig Veda. All right, the last question. Yeah, and that happens. It's all it's an occupational hazard. Remember, <laughs> remember <laughs> eliminating eliminating does not mean actually shutting it out. Eliminating means here in Vedanta, it means discernment, separating. You can't eliminate the body. The body is there. You can't eliminate the universe. The universe is there. But I am not it, I am not this, I am not the mind. The difference between this. If you fall asleep, repeat. That's why. It's an interesting thing. One Tibetan master put it beautifully. Uh, to remain in prolonged samadhi, it requires a very purified mind. For us at this stage, deeper absorption can be attained by multiple repetitions of it. So you noticed in the second session what I did, I number of times I asked you to close the eyes, but then I again asked you to open the eyes and again come back to the flower and again go back to the eyes, then to the mind and then to the witness of the mind. It's better to do short bursts of samadhi. Otherwise, the danger will be tanik samadhi lag So instead of falling asleep, repeat it. Open the eyes, look at the wall maybe, and see that's the wall. Turn your attention back to the eyes, from the eyes to the mind, to the back to the witness of the mind. This will keep the mind occupied in this exercise. You will not fall asleep. <coughs> the falling asleep, so two, two dangers. One is falling asleep, lazy mind. Another one is restless mind, not willing to engage in this uh, exercise. Both, one is rajasic, one is tamasic. What we require is an alert mind and yet a calm mind. That's the sattvic mind. On that note, we'll end here. Tomorrow, what's there in the menu for us is, um, <laughs> is a meditation where we shall see not only ourselves as consciousness, but the entire universe as arising in this consciousness. What we studied today, a nididhyasana, Vedantic non-dual meditation based on this study. Also, we shall try to understand this logically, or philosophically at least. How can the universe be me? I am a little guy. How can I be the universe? The universe how is the universe nothing but me, the consciousness? That we will try to see. So that will be the first session. And then we will go ahead. The sessions after that are all very nice. The benefits of what we are doing. This is the groundwork. The groundwork is almost over with the meditation tomorrow. And then the rest will just be, we will keep deriving the benefits of all of this uh, brainstorming. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat 
ಶ್ರೀರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾರ್ಪಣಮಸ್ತು ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ please everyone remain in your seats and allow the swami to exit the hall thank you so much for your consideration